All right, welcome back to our real estate investment webinar series. Today, our guest is Joe Aulis. He is the chief investment officer for the Peak Group. And he, they've been working uh, with us here at the White Coat Investor, um, primarily for an investment called the Peak Housing REIT, which is a real estate investment trust that invests in primarily in single family homes. It's a way to get exposure to that particular asset class of real estate without having to own the homes yourself, without having to get the 3 a.m. toilet calls, without having to deal with you know the management or the tax consequences or any of that. Uh, welcome here into this webinar, uh, Joe, and it's great to be back with you. It's great to be back with you too, Jim. Thank you for inviting me today. Yeah, I know you've got some slides prepared and um, I think we'll go through those and I'll interject questions as we go and try to uh, uh, get people's questions that I know they often have when they first learn about this investment answered during this webinar. And then we'll get this out to them and, uh, and let them know about this opportunity. That's great. And we've been uh, with you guys now for over nine months, I believe. And we've had a large outpouring of support and investors from White Coat community. And we uh, have really enjoyed working with all of you guys. So thank you very much. And yeah, I think I think a couple of things that people really like about uh, the peak housing REIT, uh, one's the diversification. You get just get tons of diversification, not only from other real estate investments. If you have multifamily or, you know, retail or office investments or whatever, here's a chance to get into single family homes. But they also appreciate the low investment minimum. You know, there's a lot of private real estate investing that you can't get into for just $25,000. And you can get into the peak housing REIT for that. So I know they appreciate that. And I think they also appreciate the simplicity of a REIT when it comes to filing their taxes. They just get a 1099. There's no multi-state tax returns. There's no waiting months and months to get a K-1. It's really um, something that I think investors appreciate. So I'm not surprised you're seeing a lot of people interested in investing with you. That's exactly right. We want that ease of use for our investors. And even though the minimum is 25,000, they're gaining access to a very sophisticated single family rental home uh, portfolio and strategy that's going to create a lot of long-term gain and dividends for our investors. So we're we're excited to be part of the platform, and I'm exci excited to be talking to you about it today. So I guess I'll I'll just walk us through a little bit more about the company itself, our thesis of why we're building this investment, and some more information about the investment itself. So first off, the the Peak Group is actually a vertically aligned company that services our real estate investments, which are the peak housing REIT. And so when you think about vertically aligned, we have a property management company, we have a title company, we have a repair and maintenance company, and we have a new construction company. And we handle soup to nuts, everything across our portfolio, which allows us to streamline operations, but also control things very closely. The peak housing REIT right now has around 1,850 homes. So an investor joining us today is getting a share of those 1,850 homes and the cash flow that those homes produce and the appreciation that those homes produce as well. But not only that, our peak housing REIT is also building new homes. And those are commonly referred to as build to rent communities. So our REIT right now is participating in the construction of 500 new homes. So investors that want to gain access to not only just the scattered site for rent houses that exist today, but also participate in the construction of new homes and that alpha, that excess return associated with that, the peak housing REIT is a good way to do it. Our entire ecosystem has around $310 million under management. We have 625 investors that have joined us. We started and launched the REIT in 2020. But our entire platform, the Peak Group, has been around for nearly 20 years. We revalue our shares on a quarterly basis. And investors joining us here in the second quarter of 2022 would be buying shares at $13.63. And our current yield today, meaning a dividend that's paid out, is at 2%. And we expect that to grow substantially in the years ahead. So we have a pretty large team. There's 110 people across the peak organization, and I lead the investment management services. 
White Coat investors who see this slide might also recognize Elisa, who is part of our team and handles a lot of the investment management services. When you think about single family rental, I wanna really make sure people understand that this is buying single homes or townhomes. This isn't apartment complexes. This isn't the garden style apartments. This is truly single homes. Each of these are deeded individually. What that means is we have the ability to acquire a single home, but also sell a single home not just a whole complex of 100 apartments. And because of that, there's a lot of benefits here. First off is we have very stable cash flows. The occupancy of single family rental homes is very high across the nation right now. It's nearly 98%. In addition to that, we have that tax efficiency that our REIT is able to capture and we pass that tax efficiency on to our investors. We have the appreciation of not only the ability of the, the underlying assets themselves, but the inflation and protection that comes with having year-long leases and our ability to raise rents on these houses on a yearly basis. Our REIT itself has four strategies for growth. As we take in new investors and raise new, new money from our investors, we're buying single homes, which is called a wholesale acquisition. We're doing a lot of new construction. I mentioned we have 500 homes that we're building. Those are built to rent communities. We're expanding to new markets, and I'm going to get to the markets that we're servicing soon. And then because we're structured as a REIT, we have a very unique opportunity in what's called a 721 exchange or an upreach. And that's unique for investors who already own a single family rental home. They could sell their home to our REIT in a tax free exchange. I'm sure your investors have heard of 1031s. Well, the up REIT is effectively a 1031 to a REIT. And it's commonly referred to as a 721 exchange. So that's helped us grow pretty quickly. Our current markets today were, were headquartered in Dallas-Fort Worth, which is our primary hub where most of our homes are owned today. But we're expanding out across the Sun Belt, similar to other strategies. And the reason we're focusing on that is we want those high growth markets. But we're not just focused on the very typical high growth MSAs like Atlanta or Dallas-Fort Worth or Austin. We're focused on secondary markets where we aren't seeing as much institutional competition and we're seeing a lot of great cash yield opportunity and still significant growth. So we choose communities that are having higher population growth being driven by new jobs and new job creation, but are still the smaller markets than the major Atlantas, Arizona, uh, Phoenix, and, and that size. Today, the four states we're in are Texas, Missouri, Indiana, and Georgia. We're going to be adding Alabama and Florida in the year ahead. And you caught this already, Jim, but one important aspect of this is even though you own a portfolio of homes as an investor in our REIT, across these markets, you only get one 1099 dividend statement at the beginning of the year. You don't have to file different state returns. You don't have to wait for K-1s. And that's a very big benefit for working with our REIT. Now, you mentioned a term MSA, which I think is pretty common in the real estate uh, space. But I'll bet there's a lot of people listening to this webinar that don't know what you mean when you say MSA. So why don't you explain that to them? So an MSA would be like the entire uh, geographic zone of a large city. So if you think of uh, um, Dallas-Fort Worth, that full MSA would encompass not just Dallas, but it would also encompass Fort Worth, the city, but it would encompass all the secondary kind of cities around it. So far reaching of like Weatherford, Texas, all the way to McKinney, Texas, to Burleson, Texas. And that whole kind of geography is commonly referred to as the MSA. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's metropolitan statistical area, right? Yes, sorry, I should have started with that part too. So it's the whole, the whole metro area. Right. That's right. And really what you're seeing is that there are these creation of these metroplexes where there's huge gravity 
that's bringing more jobs, more companies, because the population is there and growing. And Texas is especially interesting because of the ability to absorb that growth. And so you saw just uh, recent news that Caterpillar is moving from Chicago down to Texas. Same thing's happening with a lot of other producers. The reason they're doing that is it's a tax-favorable state, it's a business-friendly state, but more important, the population is there. And the population is attracting more population. And so that's a very good example of that kind of growth that we want to plant our flag in and go and capture. You see that in other MSAs as well, and, and some very interesting kind of secondary markets where that occurs as well. So I mentioned our build for rent platform, but that's a big part of our growth and a big aspect of our long-term gain that we're expecting in the REIT. So right now we are building all in Dallas, Fort Worth, and that's because we have a construction company there. So we can handle everything from land development to horizontal construction, which is like pouring the foundation and the pads for the, the driveways and putting in utilities, to the full vertical construction the leasing, and then the stabilization of those communities that we're building. And this is a, a pretty attractive part right now. And it's very, uh, there's a lot of interest from Wall Street, I think is what I would say with this. And so what we've done with our REIT is our REIT has entered into joint ventures where the REIT not only is an LP investor in that joint venture, which means a limited partner, but the REIT is also the general partner of that. And what that does is all that promote, if your investors are familiar with the concept of carried interests or the promote, all that flows to the REIT. So that effectively means if you're an investor in our REIT, not only are you getting inclusion into these build to rent communities, but you're also receiving all of that general partner economics, all that promote that flows through. And that's just intentionally going to juice our returns, increase the shareholder yield, and increase that shareholder value long term for these projects. Now, on these uh, these build for rent communities you have here, what percentage of those are rentals? What percentage are people that are just buying homes in there and just owner occupied homes? That's a that's a really good question. So everything that you see on this, this is all build to rent. So 100% of these homes are going to be built in communities. And that whole community is going to be a rental community. And most of these are in townhome style formats. So think about um, a large acre, uh, large acreage, like maybe five to 10 acres, where we'll build fourplex complexes with open green space and parks and facilities around them. So it creates a full community. It's a nice walkable kind of uh, desirable zone. But we also like to focus on what I call more infill locations. So we'll be building where there is closer amenities. We don't want to be so far out that uh, occupants and tenants in our communities can't easily get to the grocery store, for example. And so that's um, uh, this is a big part of our strategy and our growth going forward, for sure, and something that we're really excited to continue growing. And I really wanted to kind of take a quick moment. So this is a prime example of, of one of our projects uh, called Parkside. So you can see these are homes that are standard three bedroom, two bath homes. They might have an extra space that could be utilized for a playroom or a den, but they all are very high quality. So this would match what you would call a B plus or an A minus apartment complex quality. That's pretty desirable when you start to think about having your own garage to park all your toys or your cars in your own yard for, a, for your animals. And so these have become highly desirable and they're leasing up very quickly. So before we kind of jump on to uh, single family, I wanted to take a moment to really educate investors about why I believe long-term single family rental homes are going to be one of the best asset classes to have in their portfolio. And to me, that really comes down to a supply-demand mismatch and a huge op opportunity to aggregate homes. So I want to walk through kind of our thesis of why we're building this REIT and what we expect to take it to. 
And to start with that, I think one of the common misconceptions is how large this market is. Today, single-family rentals are nearly 16 million homes. But the value of those homes, interestingly, is nearly identical to the value of all the apartment complexes out there. So we're talking 16 million single-family rental homes comparatively to about 19 million apartment homes. So this is a large market. And what's even more interesting is if you think about apartment homes, who owns those? Jim, it's probably a loaded question, but it's mostly owned by institutions. So you think of large publicly traded REITs, you think of large organizations, they own most of those garden style apartment complexes. Who owns the single family homes today? Well, you know what? It's mostly smaller investors. And that's really demonstrated here. Only two to 3% of all single family rental homes today are owned by institutional investors. The peak housing REIT is an institutional investor. Other publicly traded REITs are as well. Pension funds, groups like that. And even though all the news that you read about institutions coming in to buy single family rental homes, that's true. They're definitely here to be buying. And I think in Q1, Redfin just said that between 18 and 20% of homes were purchased by institutions. That shows that there's a big aggregation story coming right now. But today, we're starting from a very small point, only 2 to 3%. So what our thesis is, is that the peak housing REIT can be very efficient in buying homes that are high quality and aggregating a portfolio. Our intent then is to aggregate to a portfolio size that a larger institution that is trying to place more money could come in and buy portions of our portfolio or absorb us all together, provide liquidity for investors, all sorts of good things. So this is an aggregation story. And the big thesis here is that we can buy houses today individually, which is pretty hard, for a discount compared to what the whole portfolio will be worth when everything looks the same, is managed the same, and is super easy to operate for a large institution. Now, a lot of people kind of wonder, like, why are, why are we choosing as a society today to move to a rental strategy versus owner-occupied? And I think we could spend the entire webinar talking through that, but I want to focus on some positives because I think a lot of the news today is about affordability and how hard that is. That's definitely true. But there are some positives, and the positive reasons that we're seeing, especially with the millennial generation, is the less, it is essentially flexibility. People want flexibility. They want less maintenance. They want the ability to have less financial constraint and financial responsibility. And being a renter as a single family home provides them those three things in addition to having their own house in their own community. And what we're seeing is that the renters of a single family rental home are stickier than renters of apartment complexes. And that makes sense if you think through it. If you're renting a three bedroom, two bath house, you're choosing areas and communities that have good schools, have good facilities. If you're bringing a family there, you're bringing your family, you're putting them in a school district and in a school, you don't want them to change. So our average tenancy is reaching over two years now versus apartment complexes, the average is around a year. But that gets to the big kind of supply demand equation. And I think this has been in the news all over, so I don't wanna rehash this too much. But all the pricing pressure we've seen, both in the house affordability, which is effectively the house prices increasing over the last 24 months, but also rental rates increasing over the last 24 months. That was all projected years ago to be happening because of this massive supply, demand, and balance. Coming out of the Great Recession, builders stopped building houses that were the entry-level houses. When they started building again, they focused on the luxury market, which had the highest margin for them. What that led to is about 10 years of undersupply 
of these entry-level, what I call rentable houses. At the same time, that undersupply for 10 years was met by the millennial generation entering their peak household formation years. And after 10 years of this going on, we have between two and five million household deficiency. It is a supply side problem. And I don't think it's going to be made up anytime soon. We cannot build our way out of this. And everything that happened during COVID, which slowed down builders, and everything that's happening today with interest rates going up is slowing down building and delivery of new houses. And what is that leading to? It's leading to inflation of rents. And that's a very interesting aspect of this. Our portfolio today, the market rent compared to the rent that we're charging today is around a 30% delta. That's because the last two years have seen such massive increases of rental rates. There's no way for us to snap our fingers and capture that in a year. It's going to take us multiple years for our houses to renew tenants or release to new tenants to reach those market rates. But that gives us that runway to increase our dividend naturally with assets we already own. And that's a pretty powerful thing. A lot of people ask me for what's my crystal ball for rental rate growth in the future. I think we're going to see another bump up over the next 12 months, but then I think we're going to slow for a bit as the consumer catches up and takes a breather in terms of all the inflation hitting them all at once. So we're reaching that point where what is actually affordable? So let's jump through the peak housing REIT really quick, because I want to share some information about this. So Jim, you mentioned correctly, we have a $25,000 minimum. Investors can invest with cash or IRA. You have the option of receiving your dividend, which is paid quarterly in cash, or you can reinvest it. So a lot of investors who have a long-term horizon, they might choose to reinvest. If you want to live for the income, you can certainly take cash quarterly. We revalue our shares on a quarterly basis, and we expect based off of our portfolio today and the value-add implementation and the new build-to-rent communities, our projection is that we're going to double investors' money over the next five years. And along the way, we'll be paying a current yield, which is pretty fantastic. Can you go back to to that slide for a minute, Joe? Sure. Um, Down under the... uh, under the terms, it talks about the 8% preferred, yep. uh, as well as an 80-20 split above that. Is there a catch-up on that 80-20 split? Good question. There is not. No. So it's a, uh, it's pretty, it's very investor favorable. We have very simple fee structure in addition to that. So it's a 1.35% asset management fee, and then a one-time acquisition fee of 1.35%. So our fee structure and, is very simple for people to follow, and uh, we like to keep it that way. Again, I mentioned simplicity is one of our core tenets. And can you explain the asset management fee? That's, uh, or rather, rather, sorry, the acquisition fee. So it's 1.35% of the equity or the total value of the home added to the portfolio, or what is that? That's a good question. It's the total value of the home. So if we're buying a $100,000 home, it would be $1,350. That would be paid at time of closing. It would go on to the, the title settlement statement as well for that. Okay. Now, I know the minimum is $25,000. What's, uh, what's the average investment that people make with you? Yeah, that's a good question. Right now, it's over 120000 is the average. We have people who have invested over a million with us. And we have quite a few that have come in at that 25000 that we've seen reinvest on a quarterly basis. And after you meet that minimum of 25000 you can increase your investment in any increment. All right. So one, one aspect I wanted to capture quickly is as we grow this portfolio and we begin to stabilize the homes that we're, we're acquiring, what you're going to see is that we're going to have share price growth start to taper off while the current yield, effectively our ability to 
raise rents, capture those rents, and pass it back to investors as dividends, those dividends are going to start going up. So right now, investors joining us today are, are getting the double benefit of a lot of built-in value-add appreciation over the next couple of years. And then they're going to see a higher dividend yield into the future. And uh, this is our historic distribution schedule and then what we're projecting out as we go forward. And one aspect that a lot of people forget about is a 2% dividend yield today is on today's share price. But for investors who joined us when we first launched, when our share price was only $10 a share, well, their dividend yield on that original $10 is substantially higher than 2%. And so as the share price increases into the future, you'll see that we're going to be paying a current yield on that existing share price, but your cost basis will be at the previous, the older share price, which will mean that you have a higher dividend when you're comparing your your original investment. A A lot of questions come in about how do I get liquidity out of the fund? And we are a privately traded real estate investment. So I want investors to think about this as a long-term investment. You're, you're creating a long-term partnership with us. And we really do think of you as a partner alongside us. I'm the largest investor in our REIT. And the other people that I showed on the slide, the other executives, are the other largest investors in the REIT. So our skin is in the game right beside you, paying the same fees and everything else. Liquidity is an important question to us, but we have a two-year lockup, and that's to allow us to go and implement our value-add strategy. After that two years, between years two and five, if investors request redemption from the REIT, selling their shares back to the REIT, the REIT will buy them at a slight discount. After year five, investors can request liquidity, and we and the REIT will redeem those shares at par value for what the share value is at that time. We anticipate meeting the demands of investor redemption through various strategies that are demonstrated on this slide, ranging from simple recapitalization of the portfolio, which we do quite frequently. That would pertain to taking a portion of the portfolio and refinancing it to tap the equity that's been created in our value-add strategy to taking a portion of the portfolio and selling it to outside investors or institutions. But because we have also the ability to sell individual parcels, we constantly look at our portfolio to find houses that might be better suited to sell to an owner user than to hold as a long-term investment as a rental. And that provides additional liquidity as well. We talked a lot about the taxation of the REIT and our, our strategy around that. So I want to echo again that investors of the REIT receive a 1099. A lot of times investors think just because they're receiving a 1099 that they're going to have dividend income and they're not getting the benefits of the tax savings that a, a, a person who invested in a partnership would see. And that's false. We use the same depreciation, and same strategies that an operating partnership does, we do that within the REIT itself. So the REIT itself captures that depreciation. The REIT itself then gets to pass through our cash yield or our dividend and reclassify that as what's called box three dividend, which is characterized similarly as return of capital. So we have that same tax favorable treatment, but it's just being passed through the REIT. We expect that to continue for a few more years, which is a a real good benefit for investors joining us today. We believe in transparency and sharing information with our investors. We do that through our quarterly reports which come through both with commentary from me, but also uh, full balance sheets and profit and loss statements. We have full yearly audits 
and quarterly REIT tests. We have a third party group review and analyze our share value on a quarterly basis. And we provide our 1099 dividend statements in the first few weeks of January of the year. And I think with that, I think that was all I had to kind of go over, Jim. And I hope well, that, good. that 30 minutes was a, a good education for folks. Yeah, let's uh, let's transition into the Q and A period. I've got lots of questions uh, that uh, the white coat investors frequently ask about this and similar investments. Let's start. Uh, let's start a little more about you, maybe, and tell us uh, why. I mean, you're the chief investment officer here. Why are you in real estate? What's uh, what's your motivation here? Yeah, so my my story is actually kind of fun. I started out working for Microsoft right out of college, and I did that for over ten years as a product manager. So um, a very technical person, basically. And as part of that, I was always fascinated by finance. I thought I was going to go work on Wall Street, and especially during the, the, the financial crisis, just became super interested in everything happening there. And instead of working on Wall Street, I bought commercial real estate, because that was that was super value add in the Great Recession. That led me then to turn effectively a hobby of owning my own commercial real estate into a passion. And I started a previous company, and that company was a syndicator of office buildings, industrial buildings, and retail buildings. I had three funds, raised nearly $300 million within this ecosystem. And then in 2020, I sold that platform to launch the Peak Housing REIT. And I did that because I believe that this is one of the last great opportunities in our lifetime to create massive alpha in real estate. You can see that there's so much happening in the in the change of real estate as far as the aggregation of these homes by institutions to all the technologies that's making it easier to manage scattered site homes to the in- investor interests and wanting to gain exposure to this as an institutional asset. So everything came together. All my passion goes into this, and we've we've had a really great journey and a very good path ahead. Awesome. And uh, I think we've talked before about uh, it was kind of a good blend uh, when you came together with the other principals here. They had the experience in the single family homes. You had the experience in in running the funds and raising money and uh, doing syndications. And and it looks like it's worked out very well for for your group to get together. It is. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, mortgage rates. I mean, rates seem to be going up, uh, you know, uh, very rapidly in 2022. Um, How do higher interest rates impact uh, the fund strategy? Yeah, that's a, um, I would say interest rates are the biggest double edged sword that we could have here. So I'm going to talk about both sides of of where interest rates are impacting us. So first and foremost, higher interest rates are going to push more people to choose to rent because it's impacting housing affordability. So that in turn should help the portfolio we own today. I also believe higher interest rates are going to tamper expectations of house continued appreciation. And I hope that in the next few quarters, we start to see more nervous house owners and especially investors look to start to sell their houses. We stopped buying houses in January of this year. And we did that for objective reasons. And I don't want to give away too many secret sauce type techniques here, but we did have some very early indicators that we were seeing pricing escalation to the point of of a peak in that January, February, March time period. We have not been aggressively buying houses after we were very aggressive buying houses last year. I expect that by the fourth quarter this year, we'll be back to aggressively buying houses. But what's happening with interest rates within our portfolio? You're right. The same 3% five-year term rates are now 6% for us. And that's pretty scary when you think about that, doubling in less than six months. But most of our debt is already fixed for long, long term. 
We have debt ranging from 2.88% locked in for 10 years to some portfolios on five-year rates less than 5%. So most of our real estate is very well insulated from the interest rates that we have today. The remaining assets we have are on what are called bridge loans. These are loans that lenders put in place for us to aggregate homes. We have one facility with a very large Wall Street bank that's locked at 3.1%, and another facility for what I call a mid-sized bank that's locked at 4.1%. That gives us the ability to acquire homes and keep them on this effective bridge loan until we're ready to move them off onto permanent financing. My expectation is during this higher rate environment, we're going to keep utilizing these bridge loans, which are tied to shorter term indexes. So they're typically tied to the one month LIBOR. The one month LIBOR is still pretty low comparatively to long term treasuries. And what that what that is effectively causing for us is our interest rates have not been ticking up one for one with the treasury. So we're still in very good shape. What are your biggest concerns with the real estate industry? You know, I think for single family rentals in particular, the operational aspects of these homes long-term are uh, a big a big nut to crack, so to speak. And I don't want that to get lost on investors. Owning and managing 20 properties as a single investor is really hard. Owning and managing 1,800 homes is still really hard. And having the operational efficiencies and programs for that is going to be what makes our company successful and make other companies successful as well. So specifically to our industry, that that's very important. For the whole macro environment with real estate, I do think the supply demand imbalance is going to continue to play through for the next decade or longer. And that's going to uh, keep the values of the assets we own and, and of homes in particular high. And I expect that after we get through this rate environment and hypothetically possibly a recession, we're going to see a continuation of housing prices going up long term. Now, investors have a choice. They have uh, the option to go to the public real estate markets where they can get daily, hourly, minute by minute liquidity. That's right. Why should they choose to invest with you instead of public real estate markets? That's a really good question. And uh, a lot of times we get that very same question. So I'd like to kind of point out a couple of different things. When you invest in a publicly traded REIT, you're paying that liquidity premium. And that liquidity premium offers you the chance, like you're right, you can look at your share price today, you could sell it today, you'll have the money in your bank account tomorrow. But for that liquidity premium, you're paying a huge price compared to our REIT. And that's measured in cap rates. Are your investors familiar with cap rates? I think so, but it wouldn't hurt to go over it again. Sure. So a cap rate is it's commonly referred to as the capitalization rate. And it's effectively, if you think about it simply, it's measured as a percentage. And it's essentially the net operating income that you're producing or the profit you're producing on the price of the asset you're buying. So if you buy an asset for a five cap or a 5% cap rate, you should receive a 5% profit. If you're buying something for a 3% cap rate, you're receiving a 3% profit. So the lower the cap rate, the more expensive the real estate. That is the same thing that's happening with that liquidity premium. If you come into our REIT, you're buying shares that are reflecting effectively a 5 to 6% cap rate. That same, so that means we can produce more profit off of the share that we have. To buy Invitation Homes, which is the largest homeowner today in a publicly traded REIT, their cap rate is somewhere around 4%. So that delta of between 1% and 2% in that cap rate is that liquidity premium. So that's the first reason. The second, though, and I think this is the most important, when you're buying 
assets or, or buying effectively a REIT, you're buying the market. Invitation Homes is effectively the market for single family rental homes. There's no alpha creation. You're just getting the beta. It's just like buying the S&P 500. If you want to receive alpha in the form of a value add strategy, which is what we employ, in the form of doing new build to rent communities and capturing all of that value creation, and in terms of executing a strategy where you also receive that general partner promote or the carried interest, you should choose our REIT. And so from my standpoint, everybody should have single family rental homes as part of their strategy long-term. It's a new asset class. If you choose to go the route of a publicly traded REIT, you're going to gain exposure, which is great, and you should do that. But the trade-off for that liquidity is a lower return long-term and then missing out on the opportunity for that, that value-add strategy. Let's talk about investors specifically. Who, how would you describe your ideal investor and perhaps tell us who should not invest in the peak housing REIT? Yeah, that's really good. When I think about an investment strategy for myself and for my own portfolio, I think about the time frame, and I think about the goals, and I think about the allocation. Investors who come into our REIT should be thinking a five to seven year time frame. So if an investor wants their money back next year or two years, this is probably not the right investment for them. We can support that. And so if an investor is worried about, hey, what, what if something really bad happens, like I pass away and it goes to my estate and they don't want to deal with it, we certainly can help with that situation. But for most part, I want investors to think about this long term. So that's the time period. The second, for goals. When I think about goals, I think about wanting to match my investment to what I need. So right now, I because I have a job day to day, like many of the investors, I have income coming in every single day. So I don't need to rely off the dividend today but I sure as heck want to see that capital appreciation. The beauty of the peak housing read is you're going to get that capital appreciation as we're implementing these value-add strategies. And as the portfolio stabilizes, it will start to produce higher dividend yields and higher income. So that allows me to effectively create an investment where I get to see the higher appreciation now, which is my goal today, transforming into a higher dividend yield long-term, which is what I want to be able to live passively off of my investments. Now, let's get into the weeds a little bit for some unique situations I think some people yeah. might be interested in when it comes to the peak housing REIT. Uh, you mentioned the four places you are now and a couple of additional estates you expect to expand into soon. Um, Tell us about uh, how somebody might go about doing a 720 ex 721 exchange into the fund. Do they have to have a home that is in one of those geographic areas? What, uh, what exactly do you look at when they come to you and say, I've got rental property, I would rather own shares in the REIT, will you take it as an up REIT? How do you decide whether to take them or not? Yeah, uh, so first off, we are encouraging everybody to send those to us. We evaluate them independently. So even if it's not in a market where today, it might be a market we're going to tomorrow. So we want to have a discussion. So I encourage people to reach out. Most of the transactions we've done today have only been in the markets that, that we're in, which makes sense because we have the property management teams in place there. When we have somebody come in as an upread exchange, we're doing the same analysis as we do when we go to purchase a home. So we're going to come and look at it, understand how much it will cost to get it to the, the standards of our, what we call the livability standard for a home in our portfolio. And we will negotiate a purchase price just like if we were buying it. So what that does is, one, it helps that investor understand what their home is worth. But two, it ensures that our REIT is acquiring homes very candidly that we're getting good values. On. What that investor who's selling their home to us in a 721 exchange is really gaining is simplicity, 
massive savings on tax. I mean, they're paying no tax until they sell their shares at the REIT. But then also a transaction that can occur without them having to lose their tenant. And that's a very important aspect of it today. If you have three homes today and you want to sell one, it's very hard to sell it with a tenant in it. So you have to have a tenant leave and then you have to do all the repair and maintenance to it. And then you can list to sell and you're going to pay a 6% brokerage commission. Well, those three steps are erased when you sell via an upread exchange. There's no commission. So you're going to get a savings there. We don't have to have the tenant leave and you don't have to handle all the repair and maintenance. That's a pretty big benefit. Let's talk about uh, sidecars. Do you do sidecars for your build for rent strategy? We do. And in fact, we had one go out in April of this year. That was a $9 million sidecar for a build to rent community. And we had a lot of interest from the white coat investors. We'll continue to employ that strategy into the future for both our build to rent communities, but then also as we start to find other portfolios of properties that we want to buy. We introduce those first two investors of our REIT and then expand that out to the community. And the real kind of benefit, if you go back to your question about the investor fit, these communities have a shorter investment time horizon. The average build to rent community, we plan to have between 18 and 36 months in that investment vehicle. So that's that quick turnaround of money that investors might want to go and have a a potential higher risk because you're taking the development risk, but a higher potential return. Can we talk about the underwriting and risk management process for the REIT? Yeah. So within the underwriting, uh, I, I could... I can spend all day. And in fact, I might record a webinar for you guys on how we underwrite projects because it's pretty interesting. But if you think about it, the net operating income is what we have control over. And the underlying cap rate, which we've talked about already, is what we can't control. So when we underwrite, we like to raise the cap rate to ensure that we have flexibility, essentially that buffer. And that buffer is a higher cap rate, meaning if we're wrong and cap rates go up, that we're still protected in what we're buying. But when we're underwriting, we underwrite rent growth assumptions, which are the most important, and expense controls. We look at every single piece. So when we underwrite a house, we're actually going and getting the insurance quote. We're actually sending somebody out to find out how much it's going to cost to do the repair and maintenance or the rehab to that house. We are working with a tax modeling expert company that actually tells us what our new tax rate will be after we buy it and the chances that we can appeal it to lower our taxes long term. We review to make sure there's no homeowners associations or if there are, what services are covered. And then we look at the rental that's in there, if there's a renter in there. And we look at the renter pool, the desirability of that house to determine how quickly we think it can lease and what rental rates we can achieve. We do that for every single house. Now, when the house is in our portfolio, we do utilize leverage, and I've mentioned that before. And we start between 65 and 75% leverage, depending on the house, the location, the renter quality, et cetera. But long-term, we are pushing down to 65% leverage. And we expect to even lower that longer term. We chose 65%, and actually I have a pretty good uh, graph on that here. Let me take that down to here. And that's because I call this the financial cushion. Break-even occupancy, meaning the occupancy that our houses need to have to pay all the fees associated with that house is 75%. Historically, the lowest single-family rental occupancy ever hit during the Great Recession was just a tad below 90%. So I call this area that financial cushion, and that's the risk management. That's a pretty simplistic way for us to make sure that we aren't going to lose investors' equity. 
where it gets more complex and where my job becomes more interesting is managing debt longer term. And how do we look at that as interest rates might be high for a longer period of time than people expect? What happens with our assets as they start to mature on their credit facilities? And that's where we might be looking to sell some assets. We might be looking to recapitalize with a larger institutional partner. Or we might be just holding and refinancing and and keeping ourselves. All right. Another question for you. You've talked a lot about, uh, you know, potentially selling the REIT down down the road to, you know, a larger Wall Street firm, et cetera. How would that impact the investors in the REIT? Would they be bought out at that time and and potentially face significant capital gains or uh, how would how what, what should they expect from that? Yeah, that's um, so one we don't know is the short answer, but understanding that I'm the largest investor of this, just like the other investors, I don't want a big tax hit. I don't want it to build something like this and put all the blood, sweat and tears that I'm putting into it only to see it all disappear after five years. So my intent would be that we transact in a way that allows investors optionality to choose to receive shares, effectively a massive up REIT to a very large publicly traded REIT. So they could receive shares of that publicly traded REIT, or they can choose to receive cash. So that would be what I'd want to structure for us to entertain a sellout in the future. What I believe will actually occur is that we'll see segments of our portfolio sell and we'll use those proceeds to offer larger redemptions for investors or pay out very large dividends that effectively pay down investors' capital during that time period. All right. I think that I've gotten uh, the list of questions I had answered. Is there anything else that you think people ought to know about the Peak Housing REIT or the Peak Group or you individually that maybe we haven't talked about yet? Well, I think one one thing that's really interesting about our company is that we're all accessible to the investors. I love talking to investors. I love helping them understand our strategy and understand how this might fit into their portfolio. And um, I encourage people to reach out via email or, I mean, you, you can see right here, my email's on the slide and um, come to our website, listen to the other webinars we've done and, and learn more about our strategy. Awesome. So the best way to get there, whitecoatinvestor.com slash peak, P-E-A-K. We'll take you right there to the landing page designed for you. And uh, you can learn everything you want to there. If there still have additional questions, you can get in touch with all of these fine folks at the Peak Housing REIT, either by email or by phone. Yeah. And uh, and get any additional questions you may have answered. Joe Aulis, Chief Investment Officer of the Peak Group and the Peak Housing REIT. I appreciate your time coming on the webinar today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you have a good day. The hosts of the White Coat Investor podcast are not licensed accountants, attorneys, or financial advisors. This podcast is free entertainment and information only. It should not be considered professional or personalized financial advice. You should consult the appropriate professional for specific advice relating to your situation.